Welcome to episode 54 of the Series About Security podcast for August 30th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm joined again by Mike Hill and Keith Watson. I'm Preston Wiley, and uh, Keith will be presenting the first article for this podcast. Yeah, this is an article on the Naked Security blog from Sophos, uh, talking about the anatomy of a brute force attack. How important is password complexity? And really, it's uh, the art. The author is uh, referring to an article posted in Redmond magazine about password complexity and its importance. And basically, the author of that article talked about uh, an experiment he did in which he asked his wife to encrypt a zip file and told her to basically, you know, pick a pretty strong password, but don't go wild on the length of the password. And then he would attempt to uh, crack that uh, password and access the file. And so they in, encrypted it with uh, WinZip using the AES algorithm. And basically, he uh, cranked up uh, some password brute force attacks to uh, try to guess the, the password. And eventually, he ramped up uh, you know, 40 CPU cores, uh, but then backed that down a bit after a while, several on eight. Uh, but basically, ran for two weeks and hadn't yet gotten anywhere in terms of breaking the password, which was very interesting. Um, we talk a lot about uh, how password length and complexity uh, protect uh, you know, lots of your secrets, and that picking you know, very strong passwords is uh, uh, very important. And this article seems to back that up, but also talks a little bit about uh, that length may not be the limiting factor. The, the big factor in uh, basically password selection depends on the algorithm that's used under the hood and some of your password choices, obviously. And then there's also the fact that the attackers have various uh, tools, and some of them are better than others. And so in the case of this particular experiment, since they use WinZip with the AES algorithm, the key that's used to encrypt the archive uses a 256-bit encryption key. But that key is then protected by a password using the PBKDF, which is the password-based key derivation function, version 2, which uh, basically uh, takes a, a text, your password basically, and converts that into something that can be used to encrypt the key that's actually used to protect your secrets. The problem with, or not the problem, but the problem for the attacker is that the PBKDF2 algorithm creates a lot of possibilities for every similar password. So uh, basically, the, the password cracker would have to basically encrypt the, or encode the password with the same PBKTF2 password uh, encoding algorithm about a thousand times for each password guess. So that is, uh, that requires much more computing power on the strength of, or on the side of the attacker. And so, fast forwarding a little bit, basically, he was only able to try about 1,200 wins of password guesses per second. Where, if it were uh, a different algorithm, such as the one that the PKZIP algorithm uses, you could do more like 25 uh, or 25 million password guesses per second, um, because it is, uses a different password uh, encryption uh, technique. So anyways, uh, the, the article talks a little bit about you know, why length may not be the, the main factor in selecting a good, strong password. It could be some other aspects of it, such as the, how that password is actually encoded, and then whether you're taking that encoded password and the algorithm behind it that's used to encrypt. So I thought it was pretty interesting. They also talk a little bit about uh, password cracking tools, and the, the example cited were, was the one where a gentleman uh, basically spent 20 grand and got 25 off-the-shelf graphic cards uh, to use as GPUs in a password cracking scheme. So 400 billion password attempts on MP4 per second. Yeah, it's the uh, size billion. Yeah. And so if you had an unsalted <laughs> SHA-1 password <laughs> hash, it would probably fall relatively quickly with that. So. <laughs> 
But if you're using password-based uh, key derivation schemes such as PBKDF2, uh, then we also talked about um, Bcrypt and Scrypt as two other options uh, that also do similar functions. That uh, those help generate password hatches, which are a little more challenging for password crackers. So it's kind of summed up a little bit. Uh, Maybe, I wouldn't say misconceptions about long or strong passwords, but some other factors to keep in mind when selecting a password, you know, look at the tool that's going to be used in. Yeah, well, I think it was a little bit of a misleading article that the, the experiment he tried um, through Redmond, um, I, I might get the terminology wrong here. I know there's like signature databases or, you know, there's common passwords. And in any in terms of weak passwords. Well, yeah, well, there's a, and like I said, I got this terminology wrong here, but I know there's like a bank of common passwords that are usually yes. tried first. And, and I didn't get the impression that he did that. I mean, for all we know, his wife might have made the password password with a zero for the O. It just hadn't reached and, that point in the dictionary. Well, right? yeah, and it, might, and it hadn't reached that point. It's a P, it starts with a P. But yet we know that that would be a, a, a fairly weak password that would probably fall within seconds using other types of tools. And, and it kind of depends on if you're using a password cracker tool and you can, you're configuring it, are you using a, a, a dictionary of common passwords, like you said, or are you starting at the beginning with A, 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 you know? right. And so you can tweak a lot of the password cracking tools and say, you know, use this dictionary and tweak the passwords you get, use uppercase, lowercase, replace, common, you know, letters such as S with a five, those sorts of techniques that can be tweaked in the password cracker as well. And I, I'm sure those that are very experienced with it have their own uh, method of doing that, which they feel it gets them results faster. So that that was not clear that he did that. And so somebody else who is a little more experienced, I think we had an article we talked about a couple months ago where there were three different password cracker guys and each had slightly different tools and techniques yeah. and spent a certain amount of time on it and got a various percentage of a set of hashes. So yeah, I mean it seemed like a, a hobbyist approach. I mean Preston mentioned yeah. you know the one could do like forty billion per second. I mean that's clearly a well, that's that's the class. That's still that is still only a twenty thousand dollar investment. We're not I mean right. if you spend well, billions can you imagine yeah. how many passwords you could break? Well, that's, that's the, the NSA. How many how many passwords could the NSA break? They can probably break a the, the PK zip algorithm in matters of seconds. No matter how probably many passwords, 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 probably could. Probably could. I mean, uh, as as the article points out with the with what what was it called PBKDF2, they could uh, the eight cores were able to deal with 1,200 passwords a second. Password guesses. Password guesses per right. second. And the and with the original PK zip uh, algorithm, 25 million yeah. right per second. It, yeah, it didn't so. use the same key derivation function. It, it, I think it's on the unsalted uh, mechanism. So yeah. Like right now, it's just eight cores. Can you imagine? I mean, well, it's in the software that's that's using a GPU. Well, that was with eight cores, and, and with uh, yeah. with the other one was with a Mac. I don't know how many cores his back had. That's true. But it may have even been less than eight cores when he was getting 25 million. Yes, it brings up another interesting, interesting question. It's Redmond Magazine. Why is the guy using the back? So, I mean, I, I think the, the, I think the conclusion um, of the original uh, research by, by that article, uh, article, yeah, Rob Brian was, yeah, I think it was incorrect that eight characters was probably good enough. And that's true if you're using the a good key derivation algorithm. Right. I think the, the bigger issue is we've not looked at, we've, some, there's been done, some research has been done in terms of password strength, but it's been in very narrow situations, right? Right. I think what we need is a, a, a stronger, bit of research that looks at not only the password you're choosing, but the system in which you use that password, and whether having a system that uses PBKDF2 or Scrypt or Bcrypt or plain unsalted SHA or salted SHA, if those variations provide different uh, requirements on the attacker side to a break in a reasonable amount of time. But I think the advice that 
is given by most security research still holds true. You should use different passwords on different uh, sites. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, because so, you so, don't always know what they're using. Somebody's the using a very core hashing algorithm, and it happens to get it, get exposed. Well, and you use the same passwords everywhere. It doesn't matter if this other site uses a stronger one. If your password is correct, there you always have password. Yeah, the article made another point as well that. As, as humans, we're not as good at picking passwords as letting a tool pick it for us yes. and store it for us. And, and that's another, you know, not only should you use different ones, but if you use a tool, let them, you know, you can just plug, it's, it's really easy to say, well, I want a 10 digit password, I want a 14 character. Um, what's frustrating to me actually using those tools is, you know, I get to a site and I'm like, oh, give me a 16 character password, and goes, oh, you can only have 14 characters. I mean, it can only be low, upper and lower case. I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, so I, I set it to the too. maximum, and I'm like, well, okay. I, I, I <laughs> personally, I start at 25 random characters, wow. and then I back it down on the you sites that don't take it. And the one I noticed the other day was like Barnes and Noble was, would only take like a 12 character password. Yeah, yeah. really? 12? 12. 12. 12. 12. And, and it just tells you. Up, I love how it just tells you up front. You know, yeah, our passwords are not going to have these special characters. Well, okay, <laughs> good. I guess they're easier to break. <laughs> At least give the no, illusion that no. you support it. <laughs> oh. I think it's a legacy mainframe sitting in the back there. So <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they are notorious for it. Maybe it's nice and special. Uh, yeah, it could be. Tied in the little mainframe. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I guess choose, choose the hot, longest password that you can. That you can. That you can. I mean, I, I think on some sites, you know, there's probably at the limit of the text field that you're given to enter the password in because they hash it and it, the length is irrelevant essentially to the hashing algorithm. So so and then yeah the hash is what gets stored in the database anyway. So it's the length of the hash that manages right the length of the field requirement in the database. So I don't I don't know why there's a limit on some places that they may be storing your passwords in clear text. What makes it easy? Or the hashing algorithm <laughs> they use may be limited to the size. I, I don't know. But uh, anything else to say on this article? Covered that one. No, I think we got it. Okay, well, my article is a fairly recent news item. Um, I think it came out a few days ago. Uh, there is a new exploit, I guess you could call it, um, in, uh, in the... Um, the font rendering engine of uh, iOS and uh, OS 10 and WebKit, which does also affect Chrome, the Chrome web browser, um, and a certain uh, set of characters, which I, from what I can tell, it has its Arabic characters, but I'm not sure if it's limited to Arabic characters, it's Unicode characters, um, can cause um, basically applications within iOS and OS 10 to crash and um, it's interesting uh, at, at the moment I think all you can do is crash things but um, it's possible that this could lead to an exploit that allows more than just crashing a system but it could allow a uh, remote code exploit um, the way that people have been exploiting this is the uh, you know a, a bad something on a web page, you could send an SMS message or a multimedia message to an affected iOS phone. You could, uh, I've seen, send a wireless access point with the text string, which would crash the, I guess, the wireless uh, application within, within the device. And uh, I, I haven't tried that, but I'm not sure if it'll crash it instantly or if you have to actually look at your your network IDs to crash it, and um, this this seems like a pretty. I mean, it's just a crash right now, so it's not it's not huge. Like wow, I'm, I'm doomed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but <clears throat> from from what I've heard, it's fixed in iOS 7, which isn't out yet, and it's fixed in, in Mac OS 10.9, which isn't out yet. But the question uh, I think that a lot of people have is, is Apple going to fix it in the current versions of iOS, in the current version of Mac OS X? And if not, why not? Because they've, they've done it before where they've left security vulnerabilities open 
um, on the previous devices, and not, not everyone's going to be able to upgrade to Mac OS. Well, I don't know if everybody will upgrade, be able to upgrade to Mac OS 10.8, but that's not going to be a free upgrade, so people will have to pay for it. And uh, not everybody will be able to upgrade to the newest version of iOS and they have all devices. So are they going to uh, leave it open? Um, another interesting thing is Facebook uh, prevented the character string from being put on people's timelines fairly quickly. And I'm guessing Twitter probably did the same thing. I'm not sure about Twitter because the ARS article links to a tweet. And, and that's well, that's what crashed my Safari well, on, 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 on the iPad here. Yeah. So I can verify it, it does, it does crash. It. So, so if you don't want to have any followers that post that string on their uh, Twitter account, you might want to unfollow them. <laughs> so, uh, so what, what's, what's your thought on this, uh, this issue? Uh, it's a fun one because it, it's part of a core API. So on Mac, they name a lot of their, their APIs core, core this, core that, core data, for example, core text, seems to be where the problem lies in this case. And on the Mac, pretty much any application that displays text on the screen uses core text, unless it's got its own text rendering engine like uh, Firefox does. But the reason Chrome is crashing, the reason Safari is, because it's using the core text API. And so that's, that's a fun one because Cortex is used all over the place and if you can stick the right input in a file and send it to somebody and they open it up, for example, like if you put it in a, uh, in a doc file and then send it to somebody on the Mac and then they go to open it with, their, with the text editor, boop, it's going to go because that uses Cortex. There's a lot of areas where Cortex is used, in fact it's used all over the place and so uh, if you can just think of a unique way of sending the string to uh, your next target, well, then you can have a lot of fun. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of fun. Um, it, it doesn't seem, right now it just seems annoying. You know, yes. It's definitely just annoying. Um, it, it's interesting to me that it's, it's fixed in the newest versions of OS X10, OS 10, and iOS 7, but it's not fixed in the current versions. And there's been no statement of whether it will be. Um, I, I think it would clearly be in Apple's best interest to fix it in iOS 6 and um, you know OS X 10.8, but I, I'm not sure. It, it, this just works a little backwards, I guess, of how I approach things. You know, if I if I discover a bug, yeah, I might fix it in development, but then push it out to production like immediately. If it's a bug fix, and this is clearly a bug, it, it, it sounds you know the, the tweet that I clicked on that that crashed my Safari on, on my iPad was actually from February 19th. So it's been around for a while, too. We can, I think we can assume that Apple was aware of this. I mean, they must have been aware of something if it's fixed in, in the newest versions coming out. So I just wonder, uh, I don't know if it's just a product management point of view. You know, we're going to focus all our attention on the new products, getting people to upgrade and buy. And it's kind of like, you know, unless we get a lot of heat, you know, a lot of attention, we're just going to let it persist in the existing <coughs> I, I think. You're right. I think it's a, a matter of resource allocation. Clearly, they, they've got a lot more engineers working on the next uh, releases. I also think that perhaps we haven't seen a, uh, a larger update. So 10.8.5 would be our next major patch update, right? Right. It hasn't, we haven't seen it in a while. There might be one in the works, and they might have rolled this correction into that. Yeah. Instead of releasing it as a security fix, because clearly it's not clear yet that there's a way to exploit this. It's merely a crashing bug. If somebody experiments with it, I'm sure they are, <laughs> and finds a way to manipulate uh, the results after it's crashed, then that's a security bug, and then that might accelerate plans to release something. So I think since it's only a crashing bug at this point, and the guys with the code would probably have a better idea whether it's, it is or not. If they look at it and say, well, it's just going to crash, they can't really input any arbitrary code to make it do something it shouldn't, then they're probably going to sit on it and say, we'll roll it into the next big into the patch update. Yeah, and they're kind of notoriously quiet on these kinds of updates as well, I believe. They don't yeah. really show their hand ahead of time. Yeah, and, and typically, and, and typically, they don't show their hand, and typically they don't want to tip off anybody if there were an issue. <laughs> But they're also probably trying to figure out a, bet, a 
the resource allocation issue, right? We, we've got stuff coming out for 10.9 and Ohio 7, so we're going we're gonna to put all our money on that. And then usually, not always, but sometimes we see that patch update come out after the next product release, but not always. Yeah. And usually, they're, they're all about the latest and greatest, right? So there are occasions where security updates do show up for older OSs, but they're, they become a little less frequent on the, on the, the, the patch updates. Uh, I'm trying to think of what the official term for those are, but the 10.8.5 will probably be the last uh, patch update for 10.8. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder if that's how they work. And I wonder if the next iOS 6 update will be one of the final ones. Probably. They, they do have a, I, I know that one of the, I guess the strengths that, of Apple's devices is they, they tend to get the majority of the users to move towards the latest operating systems. And it's kind of like if you don't move towards it, and I believe iOS 7 will still go back to the iPhone 4, but it won't have full functionality on iPhone 4. And I think if you're four, if you have an iPhone 3 or 3G, then you're not able to install it. But you know, it's kind of like if you have a 4, there's certain features you won't be able to use. If you have a 4S, there's other, there's less, you know, there's still some features, but not as many as, right. you know, the 4 won't be able to use. And if you have the 5, I think you're, you're good. And then we can assume there's probably a, another version of the 5 coming out as well with the release of iOS 7. Right. Yeah, so, so it comes back to, you know, when is it going to get fixed? Again, I, if it's not a security thing, we'll probably won't see it until a, a major patch update. If it is a security thing, there'll probably be a security update to show up. Yeah. At this point, we don't know. Yeah, at the, at the moment, it's just annoying. I think. It's annoying right now, yes. Yeah. But thankfully, Facebook has gone in and found a way to, to capture that before it becomes a problem. Yeah. Uh, that's nice of them. And also, to clarify, I said it was vulnerable on Chrome. It's vulnerable on Chrome on Mac. Apple device. Yes, yes. It's not vulnerable on your Windows, Windows Chrome is not an issue. or yeah. my Android or whatever. <laughs> right. So it's only it's only the Mac if it's you're running Chrome on a Mac. You can if you want to run it on a browser that won't crash, Firefox is an option. Now I will say the Chrome sandboxing makes it a little better of a crash on these devices uh, because it'll just crash the tab that was open, whereas with Safari it just kind of goes and it just yeah. crashes out completely. So, um, but you know, if you have the option, just run Firefox. I actually use Firefox as my primary browser anyway, so I'm not too worried about this. Now, if they hit me with other things, like you said, the dock and the messages and why wireless access points, those could become really annoying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I'm kind of wondering about that. People will really, like Apple haters or whatever, yeah. will sit in an airport and just <laughs> broadcast a bad access points to yeah, yeah, everybody. Yeah, you, you wonder where that line in the sand is drawn. I think Keith has illustrated it very well. You know, right now you could say, well, this is not a security problem. Don't but what line has to be crossed before they'll say, before users will say, yes, it is. You know, I mean, if, it, if, if they're able to constitute a way of using this so that it basically renders your wireless network useless, you can't use it in that particular area. That's sort of verging that area where it's like, well, if I can't use it at all, you know, you it, it, to, it, it, if you we know. start seeing it <laughs> pop up a little more, then it becomes, well, not a security issue, it becomes a really annoying problem. And that really annoying problem might accelerate some sort of fix for it. So, we'll see. So, so what do you think Facebook's motive was? Do they have a lot of developers that use MacBooks? I believe they have a lot <laughs> and of And they didn't want their browsers crashing. I think it's what, they might be a company where you get to pick whatever machine it is you want to develop on or do your work on. So there are probably a significant number of people there. I have a few people that work there that I know I should ask them. So yeah. I'll to find out. OK. And I'm sure all the Apple developers are running I don't have seven. <laughs> They're probably running 7.5. Yeah, 7.1. So they won't be affected by it. Probably not. All right. They're, They're not around to be annoyed by that problem. <laughs> nope. Anything else to say about it? I think we covered it. All right. So anything, any last words? For Have a good Labor Day. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It doesn't sound like we're you're going to do, be doing a podcast next week. I'm not going to be here, so um, we will attempt to. And stay tuned. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. I just put my money there. 
<laughs> maybe a guess. Let's maybe a guess. <clears throat> All right. Well, I'm Preston Wiley. Thanks to uh, Keith and Mike. Uh, have a safe and secure day.